Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You don't know what a miracle it is that I'm here today. After listening to the first two speakers this morning, I was ready to run. <laughs> Having these guys hit those home runs and then realizing I'll get up and probably strike out, you know. I must confess, when they first gave me the topic of expositional foundations, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how they wanted me to go with it. So uh, I decided that I wouldn't pay any attention to the <laughs> subject that they gave me. <laughs> but the importance of biblical exposition I know this is preach the word, and that's important. I think that the preaching, however, is in the New Testament usually confined to proclaiming the gospel to sinners. But once a person has accepted the Lord, I think that they really need to be taught. And so God sort of led me into a teaching kind of a ministry and we're always just saying teach the word of God simply but the the James when he was speaking I, I, I was just admiring him how that he could move around and uh, you know and just was so dynamic I can remember when I first started in the ministry I was pastoring a little church in Tucson and uh, my dear wife Kay sought to help me. She said, honey, you're just not dynamic enough. You just stand behind the pulpit. Now, watch Billy Graham. He doesn't just stand behind the pulpit. He moves around. And of course, those days, they didn't have the little, you know, the little mics and so forth like that. So he would take the big stand and all, and he would go over to the side of the platform and you know, he'd lift his hand and, and very dynamic. And so as she said, honey, you've got to be more dynamic. I'll never forget the Sunday I decided to be dynamic. <laughs> I, I remember it so clearly. I was getting to the major point of my message. I grabbed the microphone and I went over to the side of the platform. I lifted my hand, a la Billy Graham, was going to drive this point home, and my mind went totally blank. <laughs> now, I, I experienced that more often today than I did then. Uh, they call it senior moments, I think. I remember uh, how the two fellows had met together, old fellows, and they hadn't seen any, each other for years. They'd been in high school, played football together. And uh, they were talking about the good old high school days and how, you know, exciting and all it was and um, the, the teams that they were playing against. And... Finally, the one fellow said, you know, we had some great experiences and wonderful memories, uh, but I can't remember your name. <laughs> what is your name now? He said, do you have to know this very moment? <laughs> uh, I heard of this uh, wonderful a psychologist that uh, helped senior citizens in their memories. And uh, so these two fellows were talking about, you know, that, how that as you become a senior, you begin to forget things. You know, I notice how he walked, he, I mean, the 
things that he, re I was amazed. I mean, I just really was impressed with him. Uh, so dynamic and all that. Um, the one fellow said, well, you know, he said, I've been going to the psychologist and he has helped me tremendously. I used to have those senior moments, I'd forget things, but now that I've been to him, no more problems. I, I really, uh, you know, just got it nailed now. And the fellow said, well, that's interesting. Uh, what is your doctor's name? And, and how did he do it? He said, well, he taught me association. You start associating and, and you remember by association. He said, well, that, that is amazing. What, what's your doctor's name? He said, well, um, let's see. Um, it has a stem, thorns on it, and a beautiful blossom, smells great. And the guy says, Rose? Yes. Rose, honey, what's the name of that doctor I've been going to? <laughs> you laugh, you'll get there. <laughs> years ago, when I was in the early ministry, early years of my ministry, my preaching was all topical preaching. I had topics for about two years. So after being in a church for two years, I would ask for a transfer. <laughs> and I would go to another church and preach my two years of topics. And that went fine until I arrived in Huntington Beach. Greatest surf on the coast. Little beach town, 6,300 people in Huntington Beach when I first arrived. All of the oil wells provided a tremendous tax base for the city. So our taxes were the least in California because the oil wells took care of it. We had the finest schools in all of the state. Uh, swimming pools in the grammar school, enclosed swimming pools. I loved Huntington Beach. <laughs> loved the surf. But my two years was running out. I don't want to move. You know, I'd like to say that I got a revelation and the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Chuck, start teaching, you know. But it wasn't that way. It was just, I, I've got to do something to stay here. <laughs> so I was reading the book, The Apostle John by Griffith Thomas. I think it was chapter 7, where he gave outline studies of First John. I began to read these outline studies. They were good. As I began to study them, I realized I could make a sermon out of each of these 42 outlines that he has. I could stay in Huntington Beach for another year. <laughs> All I have to do is change from topical preaching to just expounding, teaching the Word of God. So I announced to the people, next Sunday we're going to do something different. We're going to start a study of 1 John. Now, the first outline that he has is the purpose of the book. And he gives you the three reasons that John said he wrote the book. So I told the people, I want you to read 1 John this week. And I want you to find the three reasons why he wrote it. Now, I had never 
ever, you know, you always said, read your Bible, read your Bible. That's, you know, pretty broad, isn't it? Of course, that was my problem of finding a text. You go through and trying to go through the whole Bible to find a text. I mean, you spend half your week trying to find your text for Sunday. But uh, I gave them an assignment. First time ever just giving an assignment. I want you to read this book and I want you to find the three reasons why John wrote it. About the middle of the week, people started calling me. They said, Chuck, are you sure there are three reasons? I have found two. I said, keep reading. I've read it through ten times. I can only find two. Keep reading. I said, Sunday morning, I'll be at the door as you come in, and I want you to give me the three reasons why John wrote his first epistle. Of course, John, very obvious. He said that he was writing it, that your joy might be full. That which we have seen in her, we declare unto you that your joy might be full. And in chapter 2, he talks about these things have we written unto you, that you sin not. Chapter 5, um, again, he talks about having written to them that they might know that they have eternal life. So the purpose of the book. And then I gave them assignments every for every Sunday of finding things within First John. There are several things that people say. If a man says, I know God. And, and there are some six things that people say, and, and he gives to you these six things that people say that are not always so. So I want you to find those six things. And then there are proofs to our Christian life. By this we know. And I want you to find the seven things that we know and why we know them. And then we started through 1 John. Took a whole year. The amazing thing was that there were more people came to Christ that year than in any year of my ministry. More people were baptized and the church doubled in the year. Just teaching through 1 John. Well, I was excited. I still didn't want to leave Huntington Beach. <laughs> and I had developed a new style of ministry. Not topical, but just expositional studying of the word. So had a professor in Bible college that said the book of Romans will revolutionize any church. I thought, well, I'd like to see a revolution. <laughs> I'll teach the book of Romans. So I announced to the people, we're going to go now to the book of Romans. I got all of the commentaries I could find on Romans and started to develop outline studies through the book of Romans. Took two years going through the book of Romans. And it revolutionized me. I discovered the grace of God. I had grown up in sort of a legalistic kind of a background in the church that I was in. And I discovered the grace of God. And it was just a glorious discovery, personal discovery. My life was transformed in really understanding God's grace. Halley's Bible Pocket Handbook. I used to uh, make a practice of giving one out to everyone who accepted the Lord. That they could read it along with their Bible because it was so chock full of just good information in a condensed form. And I would always give, I would go to my library because it made an impression, take my book and hand it to them, and then I'd go get me a new one. 
because they were always revising it, you know. <laughs> and so I bought a new Halley's Bible pocket handbook for my librarian. I noticed on the flyleaf it said the most important page in this book, I think, was 848. Well, I had gotten so much out of Halley's Bible handbook, which now it's called Bible handbook. It was called Bible pocket then. I had gotten so much out of it, I thought, what does he consider the most important page? And I turned to it, and he said, every church should have a system of taking the whole congregation through the whole Bible. And ideally, the Sunday morning message would come out of the passages that the people read the previous week. And he gave a really how to, you know, he gave a, a, a pattern for going through Old and New Testament. But I thought, well, why not just go straight through the Bible? Start with Genesis and go straight through, and I can spend the rest of my life in Huntington Beach. <laughs> But unfortunately, my church began to prosper and grow so much that the denomination I was in noticed and they uh, sort of insisted that I take one of their largest churches, which was floundering because of a um, problem that the pastor had with morals. And so I left Huntington Beach reluctantly, but I had developed a pattern of expositional teaching, just simply teaching the Word of God, simply. And I've followed that pattern through the years in the ministry, over 60 years now. Well, but the pattern didn't start till I was 17 years in the ministry, so. Uh, but since that time, following that pattern of just simply teaching the Word of God, simply. So today, I would like to just sort of uh, go over with you how I go over a text to prepare my study of that text. It's important also, always, to consider the text within the context. Just getting a text, if you take it out of its context, oftentimes you can change the meaning of the text completely. For instance, the text, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You can preach a tremendous topical sermon on the importance of of works and the working out of your own salvation and you can develop this in a, in a you know you, you can you can run with that topic but if you read on it says for it is God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure changes it completely it isn't what you are doing it's what God will do. He is the one that has given you the will, and it's the Lord that is helping you, not just to will, but to do of his good pleasure. So the importance of taking the text within the context. In outlining the exposition for the sermon, your points should all come from the context. And then I love to use as much as possible biblical illustrations for explaining the points of the message. And so if you want to turn to Romans chapter 4, we'll do a little bit of an expositional uh, look at the fourth chapter of 
the book of Romans. If you find Acts, just turn right. Here Paul is talking basically about justification by faith apart from works. And in speaking of justification by faith, of course, we look at Abraham, and Paul uses Abraham here as uh, the classic illustration. Abraham believed God, and God imputed it unto him for righteousness. So in reading over the fourth chapter over and over again, you begin to get the whole, uh, whole picture into your mind, but you want to narrow down. Uh, and um, so in looking it over and preparing a study on it, narrowing down my own self to verses 19 through 24 as he is talking about Abraham's faith that God imputed to him for righteousness. Now, in looking at the context, going down to verse 22, if therefore it was imputed unto him for righteousness, now it was not written for his sake alone, but it was that it was imputed to him but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So this is where I'm going to go with the message. This isn't just written uh, for his sake alone. It's written for us. The purpose is to bring them to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And thus... I know where I'm going to go with this text. And I do feel that it's extremely important that you know where you're going with your message. Because if you don't know where you're going with your message, you'll never know when you got there. And you'll begin to ramble. So know where you're going with the text. Uh, very important. So this is where I'm going to go with this text. And uh, the path that I take to my goal is to study the keys to Abraham's faith. When God promised to Abraham that through his seed all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. So in verse 19, Paul tells the Romans, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. Now some translations say he considered his body, uh, but King James reads he's considered not. But if you really think it through, it doesn't make any difference. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. I take this to mean that he didn't consider the fact that he was impotent, nor did he consider the fact that Sarah had gone through menopause. You know, whenever we are faced with a problem what is our first reaction? To figure out how God might do it. I've got this situation. I've got some bills and I don't know how I'm going to take care of them, but if I will just win the Reader's Digest sweepstakes. And I'm one of the finalists. I got my notice. <laughs> and if they'll just draw my number, 
I'll be able to pay off all these bills and can take Kay out to dinner. Lord, help them to get my number, Lord. Lord, let them draw my number. But you see, that's not a direct prayer. That's a direction prayer. I've got it figured out how God to do it. And so I'm giving God directions now on how to take care of my problem. And, and our prayers turn into direction prayers, but the problem with direction prayers is that God doesn't always follow our directions. The deadline goes and they guy didn't come with a big check and the photographers and the papers to, you know, to hand me uh, the sweepstakes and Lord, you don't answer prayer. You know, and, and, and we begin to be defeated because God didn't follow our instructions. But I have discovered that God has ways that I know nothing about. God has resources that I know nothing about. And so the direct prayer is, Lord, here are the bills. I don't know how, how I'm going to manage this, but Lord, undertake for me. You've promised that you would supply all of my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And just, Lord, I place them before you. Abraham didn't look at the impossibilities. You know, we have a tendency to measure things on a sliding scale of from simple to difficult to impossible. And the way we look at things is often reflected in our prayers. Someone comes up and says, Pastor Smith, I've had a bad headache. Would you please pray that God would heal my headache? Headache? Sure. Simple. Lord, touch and heal their headache. Thank you, Jesus. Headaches, they're not a big thing. I mean, if, if it doesn't go away, go get an excedrin or something. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> headaches aren't a major problem. But if someone comes up and says, Chuck, I just came from the doctor and he said the biopsy shows that I have cancer. W would you pray that God would heal my cancer? Cancer? Ooh, cancer? Oh my. Well, you know, this, this takes more than a simple prayer. You just can't say, Lord, heal the cancer. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, this takes real, you know, real, Lord, you know, I mean, it, it, you got to lift your voice and you got to, you know, sustain a bit on this. Because cancer is serious. It's difficult. Doctors have a hard time with this and and, and we reflect it often in the way that we pray for things. As we carry over our own human limitations over to God. Now here a guy comes up to me and he's missing his right arm. He says, Chuck, I was in Nam and a grenade went off and I lost my right arm. Would you please pray that God would give me a new right arm? Are you kidding? God doesn't give new arms to people only to octopi. Don't you know that? But God said, hey, I am God. Is there anything too hard for me? Well, in my mind, yeah. But that's because I don't have a right concept of God. Abraham didn't take that into account. He didn't take into, he didn't consider his own body now dead, nor yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Secondly, we read verse 20, he didn't stagger at the promises of God. Have you ever staggered at the promises of God? Oh, I have. I often do, unfortunately. Try this one. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Have you ever staggered at that? I have. But Abraham, strong in the faith, didn't stagger at the promises of God. You know, the Old Testament tells us a very interesting story uh, there in uh, 2 Kings chapter 7. When the city of Samaria was being besieged by the Syrian army, the siege was beginning to take its toll. Inflation had set in. A head of a donkey was selling for 65 pieces of silver. A quart of dove's dung was selling for five pieces of silver. It was so desperate, women were beginning to boil their babies and eat them. And the king, in a perverted way, was blaming the prophet of God, Elisha, for this problem. God help me if I don't get that Elisha. So he sent fellows down to Elisha's house and following after them with his prime minister. And Elisha was no doubt a very interesting fellow to be around. He had these times when he would sort of zone out. So here he was with his friends talking with them and he went into one of these zonal things and he said, unreal, how about that? I can't believe. He said, the king has sent guys down to get my head. When they knock on the door, open the door and hold them fast because the king is right behind them. So there's the knock on the door and Elisha's friends pin the guys with the door and here comes the king with his prime minister. And he says, all right, you've had it, man. I've had enough of you, you know, it's over. Elisha said, king, tomorrow, by this time, they will be selling a bushel of fine flour in the gates of Samaria for 65 cents. And two bushels of barley for 65 cents. The prime minister, the man on whom the king leaned, said, if God should open windows in heaven, could such a thing be? He was staggering at the promises of God. Why? Because he tried to figure things out how God might be able to do that how God might be able to fulfill the promise that was being made through the prophet. And, and all he could see was some crazy picture of uh, some kind of shoots being opened in heaven and flower dumping down. Should God open shoots in heaven? Could such windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And the prophet Elisha said, you will see it, but you won't eat it. And that tragically is often the price of unbelief, of staggering at the promises of God. God's going to do it. You'll see it. But because you were staggering at the promises of God, so often you're not able to participate in it and to enjoy it. The next step of faith, we are told, being strong in the faith, he gave glory to God. That is, he was praising God for a child before Sarah ever was pregnant. You see, God took Abraham and said, look up into the sky, Abraham, and they're in that desert sky. No light pollution, no air pollution. They say that you can count 6,624 stars. 
And so he is out there in the desert looking up and seeing that canopy of stars overhead. And God said, Abraham, even as you can't count the stars, you won't be able to count the descendants that will come from you. And that's where it said Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, I think to encourage us, God let us know that his faith wasn't perfect. Because he still waited and nothing happened. And in a lapse of faith, Sarah, his wife, came to him and said, Avi, honey, looks like it's not going to happen. Take my handmaid, Hagar, go in unto her. Let her be a surrogate mother. And when the child is born, I will take the child into my lap and I will raise it as my own child. So Abraham went in unto Hagar. She became pregnant and the son Ishmael was born. It's an interesting thing to me that Ishmael really is the product of the flesh. It isn't the promise of the spirit. It's the product of the flesh. And it, it, it comes from trying to help God out. God, I, I know you, you've promised, but uh, you need a little help, you know. And, and so we so often in our flesh make that mistake of trying to help God out doing his business. But with Abraham, he created a real problem that his descendants are really trying to deal with today because the Palestinians are the descendants of Ishmael. And, and you know, the moment you get into the flesh to try to help God out, you're able to make a pretty good mess of things that lasts for a long time, unfortunately. Some 13 years later, the Lord said to Abraham again, I'm going to give you a son through Sarah. You're to call his name Isaac. And Abraham laughed. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. <laughs> oh, lack of faith. Laughing at the promises of God. And, the, and Abraham, in his lack of faith, said, Lord, let Ishmael live before you. In other words, that's, that's all right, God. You don't have to, you know, play around with my brain anymore. I mean, let Ishmael, I mean, I've got him. That's fine. And God said, no, through Isaac shall your seed be called. Being strong in the faith, he began to give glory to God. Now let's say that we could get in a time machine. Set the buttons for 2000 BC. Travel through time, travel through space. We uh, disembark from our little time capsule and here we are in Hebron. Back in the year 2000 BC. We decide to hike down to Beersheba and as we are hiking along the road we look on the hillside and we see this uh, vast flock of sheep. We see the herds of cattle. We see the servants that are watching over them and we see this expansive tent. And there under an oak tree sits this old man. And so as we are passing, he says, come on over, you know, it's a long way to Beersheba, you know, uh, you need a little refreshment before you go. And, and uh, he says, Sarah, sweetheart, fix some tea and crumpets, we've got some company, you know. And so as we are sitting here with this old man talking to him, talking about, you know, his vast possessions here, Every once in a while, he zones out on us. And, and as we're talking, you say, Oh, Lord, you're so good. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I'm so blessed, Lord. Thank you, thank you. Oh, never dreamed this. Lord, you're so good. And then he'd come back and he'd talk with us. And then pretty soon he'd zone out. Oh, Lord, thank you, Lord. You're so 
wonderful, Lord. Oh, I love you, Lord. And pretty soon we're curious. We say, oh, man, you seem to be awfully happy about something. What's going on? <laughs> My wife is going to have a son. Ooh, you're pretty old, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, 100. <laughs> well, how old is your wife? Oh, she's 90. Well, how long you been married? <laughs> well, I don't know. After 75, I've lost count, you know. <laughs> well, how many children do you have? Oh, we haven't been able to have any yet. <laughs> oh, I understand why you're so excited and happy. That's tremendous. After all this, she's... How long has she been pregnant? Oh, she's not pregnant yet. <laughs> As we walk towards Beersheba, we say, oh, let him alone. He's happy. You know, why, why <laughs> disturb the old guy, you know? But here he is, strong in the faith, giving glory to God. That's true faith. When you are praising the Lord and thanking the Lord before there is any evidence of the fulfillment of the promise. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. God's promises are as good as their fulfillment. If God has promised it, you can know he's going to keep his promises. Finally, we read that he was fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. He was convinced that God was able to do it. The Bible tells us now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So as you look at the situation, you look at those problems that you are facing. Let me ask you, do you think that God can do it? let will say, oh, of course, God can do anything. You, you really believe that God could do it? Well, yes, I believe that God could do it. Wonderful. You're one quarter on the way. Of the four things of Abraham, you've got one down. You believe that God can do it. Now just work on the other three. And you'll find that God will do it. He is faithful. And he will keep his word to you just as he kept his word to Abraham. Oh, as the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Father, we do ask that you would do that. We have that tendency, Lord, to question, to doubt, to wonder how you could do it and dealing with issues that really are no business of ours. They're your problems, not ours. And Lord, may we learn to just trust you implicitly, completely. May we learn, Lord, to praise you before we even see evidence of the fulfillment of the promise. Help us, Lord, that we'll not just look at things as impossible, but realize, Lord, that with you all things are possible. Thank you, Lord, for your word that encourages us, your word that leads us to faith and to putting our trust fully in you for our churches, for the people that we're ministering to, for the issues that arise in the churches. Lord, thanking you that it's your church 
and you're able to take care of it much better than we ever could. Thank you, Lord, for your word, your promises, in Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Yes.